Well, do you want to get started with uh, talking to us a little bit about uh, what you're working on right now and then taking some questions about Indo-European and linguistics and whatever else people come up with? That sounds good to me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess I'm here. Uh, I've been here now in Munich for uh, here at the, uh, the LMU, the Ludwig Maximilians Uni Universität uh, München for, for, yeah, just over a year. And um, I'm here on this like Humboldt research fellowship thing. And uh, I'm working on a book, I guess, <laughs> um, uh, on, uh, on Indo-European word prosody and, and specifically like uh, the contribution. It's really like the emphasis of the, of the book is really the contribution of Hittite and the other Anatolian languages to this, you know, this long-standing problem. Like this problem goes under like the, the, the way that people, most people have, you know, most people have heard of this problem in Indo-European studies is under the heading of like accent and ablaut. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have this problem of where does the word, the word prominence, the accent, or I call it stress, uh, go in the word and uh, and then how does it interact with like vowel quantity and vowel quality and so um, uh, uh, the traditional take on this is like you know people basically piece this together primarily on the basis of evidence from uh, from Sanskrit above all and then from Greek and then you kind of put the other pieces together from the other languages but Anatolian plays a relatively small role and um, basically the argument of the book is that like this is a fundamental mistake like Hittite, the Hittite evidence in particular is uh, really crucially important to, to the understanding of this problem. How, how does Anatolian change our picture of Indo-European prosody from the more classic reconstruction? Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, yeah, so it, more than anything, it looks a lot like Vedic Sanskrit. I think that's, that's my, that's my, it's like broad message that, um, that I kind of try to, to spread everywhere I go. And uh, to my mind, what this argues for is an approach to dealing with this set of problems along the lines that work well for Vedic Sanskrit. And so there's this big debate in the field, like there's this, I don't know, there's this kind of traditional way of approaching the accent and ablaut problem that goes back to like the 1970s and goes broadly under the name of something like the Erlangen model. And uh, this involves setting up a set of I don't know, kind of uh, morphophonological classes for, for nouns and kind of tracing these forward into the history of the languages. But basically the broad point is they set up a system that looks significantly different from, uh, from any of the attested languages, including Sanskrit. And then there's this alternative model that was proposed by primarily by Paul Kaparsky and, and well, his teacher, Morris Halley, um, in, the, in the 1970s, around the same time, but really didn't have any currency in Indo-European. For, for a really long, you know, for, well, basically they proposed it and, and nobody cared about it for about 40 years. Hmm. Um, but basically their model works really well for Vedic Sanskrit. Like they, they've developed, I mean, you know, it, it, you can extend it in a pretty natural way to Greek and Lithuanian and a few other of these languages, but it's really pretty synchronically oriented. And, um, uh, and so I've broadly been arguing that like Hittite really fits that picture quite neatly. Like it makes, it, it really converges in, in remarkable and striking ways with Vedic Sanskrit. And so we really need a system along those lines to handle the proto indo european situation. And so what is the current picture of, uh, I know that this, you know, it's a huge question, but uh, of the accent in Indo-European, I mean, are, is it a mobile accent? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo mobile accent in the same, in broadly the same way you see in the oldest Sanskrit or in, in, in Greek, uh, all the way up to the present day. Like, you know, I mean, it, it more, more, more in, in say compare as compared to something like modern Greek, more uh, alternations within inflectional paradigms. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, you, you know, it would have had minimal pairs of the type, you know, that <laughs> many minimal pairs of the type that we find in say, I don't know, English, you know, uh, convert versus convert uh, <laughs> and so on. And of course we find this in the oldest stages of the, you know, of, of the oldest Indo-European languages in, you know, in, in, in ancient Greek, you know, these are famously like Tomos and Tomos means um, uh, a slice, like cut out of a tree or something. And Tomos means uh, an adjective that means cutting, you know, the yeah. act uh, being in the process of cutting or something that cuts. And, um, uh, and so these would have been pretty widespread in Indo-European. And uh, then you would have had a kind of mix of uh, sort of morphology and phonology interacting in complicated ways that yield these the, the observed the observed um, 
stress or accentual patterns. And when we're talking about accent, are we thinking about, you know, pitch or stress or what, what is the, the picture that we're looking at? Yeah, that's one everyone, everyone is always very curious about. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, the, the traditional reconstruction would be a pitch-like accent of the same time that we see, of the same type that we see in Vedic Sanskrit um, and also in ancient Greek, although without the contour tones that we see in ancient Greek. So no, no, no Greek circumflex, that would be an innovation of Greek and uh, kind of separately in, in, the, in, in, the, um, uh, in the Slavic, well, Baltic and Slavic languages. Um, uh, and, uh, and Anatolian is different in this respect, like Hittite looks pretty clearly, looks kind of like an English stress accent, really looks like, to the extent we can judge these things, uh, uh, vowel duration seems to be like the principal correlate of, of word stress. I mean, that's the, that's the correlate that the texts really provide us evidence for. We look like, it looks like they mark vowel length and we infer stress, um, uh, from that in Hittite in particular. So, uh, so that's what it looks like in Anatolian. And then when you put these, I mean, how you put those together at the top is a little bit hard. I, I usually have kept the traditional view that it's just pitch-like, um, uh, yeah, a pitch accent, again, like Greek or Sanskrit, um, but, you know, it is a little bit hard to say. I mean, this, this a lot of depends on what, how, what, how you think the, um, the trajectory of these things are, you know, in languages in general, like, can, you know, do we have a natural trajectory that gets us from a stress accent to a pitch or pitch like accent or the reverse is the reverse likelier. Mm -hmm. I've always liked the reverse because um, one thing that is always been the, the most striking parallel to me is that between ancient Greek and modern Greek, you have this, uh, uh, you, you have a switch from again, this pitch, this pitch accent to a, to a, you know, a much more care like traditional stress accent. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what modern Greek has now. And yet, the distribution of, of stress or accent stays basically, I mean, stays very close. Like, you know, if you're, if you know some modern Greek, you can, and, and some ancient Greek, like you can kind of compare the same word and say, oh, wow, like the, the stress is pretty much almost always right where you would expect it to be um, mm -hmm. from ancient Greek. So, so, so I guess to me, this shows that uh, a system can clearly undergo a change from a pitch accent to a stress accent over a very long period. And the the, the, the surface distribution of stress can remain exactly the same. And so for me, that's always, that would be a neat parallel for the Anatolian situation where it's like, I'm suggesting that, oh, actually Proto-European stress looked pretty similar to Hittite and Sanskrit, but on the way to Hittite, it became more stress-like and yet the distribution of stress stayed basically the same. That would mm -hmm. be the case, the case I try to make anyway. It's, it's been speculated about, wondered about whether the Scandinavian languages may also be a parallel there where you see the yeah, uh, that that pitch accent in Norwegian and Swedish, but not in Danish. But then the the feature in Danish correlates with one of the stresses in Swedish and Norwegian. Yeah, that's one of those complicated. Yeah, like I don't know, if people treat that. Yeah, I think it, yeah, like debate really thorny issues on which there's an enormous Germanic internal literature, and uh, I, I'm, I confess I'm not an expert on it. I think it's an interesting question. No, sure, just just making the parallel. Is there yeah. anything from, uh, so I'm, I'm going to keep digging on this folks, feel Please. free to throw in your questions on chat. Um, but but I, I was going to ask, you know, I'm not as familiar obviously with the Anatolian source material as you, is there, what, what kind of poetry is there in Hittite? How does it work? Is, is it, does it help with reconstructing these questions of prosody and accent? Yeah, this is a great question. And, uh, People have wondered if maybe it could be helpful. And lately, I'll just prep, I'll, I'll talk more about what it is, what the poetry looks like and stuff. But I think the long story short is, it doesn't seem to help with this problem. People have hoped that it would help with this problem, but it, it doesn't really, really seem to help in a significant way. So we have the type poetry, for sure. Um, we have uh, stuff that looks like uh, epic poetry, which has epic poetry features like it really like you have things like kind of I don't know kind of like Homeric feeling noun epithet formulas so you have like things like the myth of Ulukumi and um, uh, I mean people argue about so we don't have really clear metric like uh, uh, at least there's no very strong like like clear 
evidence for meter in Hittite. People argue about it, and that's what would have been relevant to this prosody question. There was these arguments about like, oh, okay, if you take uh, uh, something like this, you know, yeah, this the song of Alakumi, this 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 is the great, I don't know, this is great, this great battle between the Hittite storm god and this giant um, giant stone monster, which which has pretty clear analogs in uh, in in later Greek poetry. This is clearly like a kind of story that is. I don't know, you know, making its way from the Near East into Greece. Mm. And you find it, you know, I mean, it has a very, it has, it has, I mean, it's clearly poetry. It has interesting word orders that we don't observe in regular Hittite, but it's also clearly uh, um, uh, it, to some extent influenced by, um, uh, by it, it's like, to some again, it's a, like translation literature to some extent. So, um, so it, you, we see this coming in. I mean, it's not, these don't seem like they're native Hittite myths in the same way that these end up in Greece, they don't actually originate in, um, uh, in, 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 with the Hittites. So they're kind of an intermediary in this poetic tradition. And so it's, it looks like poetry. The question is whether it's metrical. People have argued like, oh, maybe there, it, you can put, you can identify like four discrete kind of stresses per line. And that's what organizes it into, 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 into poetic, into poetry, like that's what makes it the poetry. Mm. And basically this is, you know, if we take all of the various texts that we want to argue that we think have poetic qualities in other ways, things like, again, like noun epithet formulas and, and, and you really can't impose that schema. Like it kind of breaks down or, or you really have to, you just kind of have to push it too, too hard to, to really make it fit the evidence. And so I think basically people have concluded like, yeah, we definitely have poetry. Exactly what the metrical principles are, are too, too hard. I mean, we, we haven't been able to really recover these just yet. And, um, uh, and so in that sense, it's not, it, you know, it, it's, it's not reliable evidence for, the, for these prosodic questions that, that I've been interested in. It's actually, you know, this is, I'll just say, this is one of the things that got me interested in doing Hittite. Like I, I you know, I read about this, you know, I got interested in the, in the idea of metrical poetry and mm -hmm. my first project, real independent project in Hittite was I sat down with um, my teacher, uh, Craig Melcher at the time, and we read through the entire uh, uh, set of texts that people had argued are, are metrical. And these are all like basically the various mythological texts of Hittite. So Lukumi, some people have argued that uh, the Ilyanka story, the, 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 the dragon slaying myth in Anatolian, some people have argued that's metrical, um, various other, um, uh, the song of release is like a, a hero Hittite. Uh, it's kind of like a, a um, uh, it seems to be, I guess more, maybe I should say, sorry, then I'll, I know I'm rambling here, but, but the, one of the, the idea of the, the, the direct source of some of this Near Eastern mythology into Hittite, it looks like it was maybe Hurrian. So hmm. it was kind of like mediated by Hurrian. And so, uh, so we have some of these hero Hittite things where you have both a, a Hittite version and a Hurrian version. And these are sometimes thought to be metrical texts in, in Hittite as well. And to clarify, for anyone who doesn't know, Hurrian is the non-Indo-European language spoken in the area that the Hittites came to dominate, correct? That's it. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And do, so, do we yeah, know anything about the affinities of Hurrian or is it an isolate? Uh, like there's some ideas about how it should be maybe grouped with some other things that are less, even less well understood. Um, mm. But I, that's... My, I'm not, uh, yeah, definitely not my expertise, but my understanding is that there's no, uh, uh, yeah, clear, clear consensus about something that is a language family that very belongs to. And I'm going to get some, to some questions in the chat in just a moment, I, but I wanted to ask you, you're talking here a little bit about Hittite literature and it occurs to me, I don't even know where to find this stuff in translation, if it exists in translation. Is there anywhere you yeah. can find some of this in English? Yeah, uh, so most of these things exist. Uh, um, lots of things exist. Someone dropped my, my re resources for Anatolian yeah. studies link in the chat. That's a good place to start. Um, that's, um, yeah, so accessible translations. Uh, there's a big, there's a whole bunch of these that are published by the Society for Biblical Literature. There's a, 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 they do, I mean, yeah, well, they do biblical literature broadly, but there's a bunch of these that are quite good. So, um, uh, Harry Hoffner has a big collection of all of the Hittite mythological texts that he has mm -hmm. a, trans a translation of. These are very, very cheap uh, volumes and, uh, and also, I don't know, 
easily available on the internet as well. Um, but, uh, it, you know, from less reputable places, um, but they're also very, very cheap. So you, one can pick these up. Harry Hoffner's one, you can find ones called things like Hittite diplomatic texts, which will be all the treaties and uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, the Hittite historical texts are often in available in translation in um, like broader collections of uh, of, of like, you know, so like there's some of these overarching collections of like Near Eastern literature in translation, um, which are, yeah, I mean, I could point people to specific resources if they're interested, but, but the, the, the major texts, like the, the major texts that are really well preserved and long, these almost all exist in accessible English, okay. accessible English translations. It's just, it takes a little bit of digging, but this is the series from the Society of Biblical Literature if you pick, if you can find just one of these, like the, the, the one Hoffner myths that, um, that, you know, you'll see, you'll be able to see then all of the other translations they have. Um, and so uh, many, many of them exist in that series and that would be a nice place for people to, to start. Great. And my assistant still uh, posted the link to your resources page in the chat yes. for anyone who wants yeah. to follow up on. on yeah. And for people who want to get in the weeds, another, there's this, there's this giant collection of resources on one of the links there. The, um, the Hittitology portal at Mines. This is like the center. This is the center. This is the center of everything for real, hit, you know, for serious Hittitologists. So this will get you links to like. I mean, you can you can pull up a, a list there called the Catalogue des Textes the CTH that um, will list give you a list of everything that exists in Hittite and uh, uh, and you know and not all of that, not necessarily all of that will exist in sort of accessible translation, but, um, but it'll give you a comprehensive list of all of basically the Hittite texts that we have. Uh, and then you can kind of click in there and there's various resources, things like photos of the tablets. And I mean, you know, th these are things that like, you know, I mean, these are things that I use all the time in my work that uh, are, you know, uh, uh, some of them will also be interest, of interest to non-specialists. Great. Thank you very much for that. Um, so let's take a couple of questions from the audience here. Uh, Cameron asks, could you talk a little bit about how Hittite was recognized as an Indo-European language? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, so the, 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 thing, the guy who uh, finally kind of uh, sorted out Hittite was this guy, Hrozny, in uh, 19, like 1915, uh, I suppose would be the year, the year of the decipherment. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, and then 1917 is the year of the publication of this first, like the first big book that really, uh, really sealed the deal on Indo-European, uh, Hittite is an Indo-European language. Um, we knew the hieroglyphs, uh, sorry, the hieroglyphs, excuse me, the cuneiform script that Hittite is written in, um, was known. So they sorted this out earlier. I mean, there's a, there's a long, there's a much more, longer and more detailed story, which people should go and get from. There's, I mean, there's a million tellings you can find of it, and there's lots of people who are real experts talking about it. But the long story short is uh, the cuneiform script that uh, that you know we already knew this from Akkadian before we deciphered Hittite, and uh, and it was really just this uh, this identification of uh, Hittite as uh, an Indo-European language, which was the you know which is this this event that. Um, so that you know basically we knew the values for the signs, like we knew the values, you know, the the syllabic values for these cuneiform signs. And it was a matter of finding uh, some set of words that were identifiable as Indo-European lexical items. And uh, Hrozny famously found uh, the words for uh, eat and drink. <laughs> so, uh, and so he was able to sort of see these and you can see something like, uh, I forgot what it is. I'm trying to think of the exact passage. It, I don't remember if it was a third plural form or first person plural form, but Basically, you know, it's, you know, eat and drink bread you have. And, um, and so the word for eat in Hittite is it's this, well, yeah. it aid me in the first singular, adon, adon, atonzi in the, uh, in the third plural. And, uh, and this looks like words for eat and drink in the other. I mean, it looks a little bit like, you know, ate me. It looks a little bit right. like, uh, you know, I eat and uh, atonzi, it looks just like Sanskrit, uh, adanti and, uh, you know, and, and, similar other words, other, you know, other, other words like this in the other Indo-European languages. So, so this, when he got, when he found these things, he was like, oh, this is, this is an Indo-European language. And then it was just a matter of kind of, uh, you know, uh, identifying the rest of the vocabulary and, and sorting things out. In fact, that would be kind of with English eat, right? I mean, 
Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's cognitive lead. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, different morphology, but it's the same. Oh, sure, it's sure. the same root. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and I'd like to ask a corollary question to that. You know, you looking at cognates, uh, obviously, is what uh, led to the initial recognition of Hittite as Indo European, but lexically, and I really do mean just lexically, does Hittite have more in common with, or Anatolian more broadly, with one branch of Indo European than another? Or is it kind of equally distant slash close from all of them? Uh, in terms of the, the lexicon, I would say it's not, it doesn't seem wildly deviant. I mean, people, when they first found it, were struck by the number of like loan words from, I mean, adjacent languages of the ancient Near East, Haddock and Hurrian and, and other and other places. But, but I mean, to my mind, this is. I, I mean, I think that you know, people people found this initially striking, uh, and then, uh, 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 but but actually, I don't think this is wildly different from what you see in in the other old in the European languages. Um, I, I, no, I, I don't. In terms of lexic, lexicon, is not where you would want to make the strongest case for Anatolian being. Uh, uh, significantly different than the other languages. I mean, some people do oh, make sure. this case. Like, there are like a few, a few, uh, a few small, a few, uh, few, few particular lexical items where someone will say, "Oh, there's some meaning that you know, original meaning that is only preserved in Anatolian and has changed going into other the uh, of the other Anatolian languages." It is possible that there are a few cases like this. Like one famous one is uh, the word, the root that means to uh, well. It, Hittite has this mercy to he, he disappears. Um, um, it means seems to mean disappear in Hittite, and this is the root that means seems means seems to mean die or be dead in all the in the in the I'm other sure. Indo European languages so the Latin sure mort. or yeah. mort. But yes, that one. And so um, and so the idea for some people there is that it would have originally meant something more like disappear, and that's preserved in Anatolian and the other ones. This is not. So I, this, this, if this is what you were getting to, and I'm not sure where that there, I mean, there is this broad consensus now that, I mean, everybody agrees that Hittite or the Anatolian languages generally um, were first to separate off from the rest of the Indo-European language family. But with this, you know, since we're talking about lexicon, lexicon is not the place where you would want to start to make this case. Like you would, build, you, you would, you know, the strongest case for this has to do with morphological features and um, and once you have these established, these morphological features, I think it's perfectly fair to look for lexical features as well. But to, I mean, to my mind, like the trajectory between from die to disappear or disappear to die, like I don't like could, he, could either of these be possible? I, I would say yes, but yeah. You know. Sure, sure, sure. And I, I didn't mean to ask it as a question implying that that would be some decisive indication of where mm -hmm. it falls on the tree. Although I'm interested to hear, um, you know, maybe later we'll take some more questions before this, but where you stand on the Indo-Hittite type questions right now. Um, mm -hmm. But more, you know, if, if it did seem to have more shared lexical items with one branch or another, would that speak to more contact or something like that? You know, I Hittite see. seems so, or Anatolian in general seems so isolated, except maybe with regard to like Greek and Armenian. Uh, and I wondered mm -hmm. if, if the lexicon reflected that at all. Yeah, uh, I mean, right. So the early in the, in the first, like the first millennium, Anatolian languages. Uh, so like, yeah, I mean, like Hittite and uh, and Lub. Sorry, sorry, excuse me, not the first, the, the second millennium, Anatolian languages. So Hittite. So we're talking like here between, uh, I don't know, uh, sixteen fifty and 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 a thousand BCE. Um, so we have during this period, we just have Hittite and Luvian. Those are the two Anatolian languages we have attested during that period. And during that period, there is vanishing. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's like maybe a couple a couple of Greek onwards. And we know that there are these Greeks right on the western coast of Anatolia during this period. From I mean, from a place named you know Hittites talk about this is the famous this is the famous the Akiawa question, right? You know, these Hittites uh, in correspondence with this great this great king from the West. <laughs> these are the, 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 uh, the, the Akiawas. These are, you know, almost always, everybody agrees now that basically that these are Greeks. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you have these, and we know that the Greeks were on, you know, the West coast of Anatolia during this period, uh, equations between like, you know, Greek, um, 
a Hittite they call it Milawanda, Greek is, is, is in Greek Miletus. Um, so you have, I mean, you have these clear Greek centers there. So, so you do see a, a, a little bit, just some, a few traces of, of that contact in the actual language uh, of, of, of Hittite um, and, and Luvian, but it's very limited. It's extremely limited. So like insofar as you find influence in the, in, in the second millennium uh, from other, from contact with other Indo-European languages, it's really, well, I should say you, you, you almost don't. What you do see is these contact with other languages of the ancient Near East that are non Indo European, Korean, right. um, to some extent, some of the Semitic languages a little bit. Um, um, so, so that's that's much more uh, real. Then, when you go forward into the first millennium BC, then you're dealing with like a much more much more intensive contact with, with Greece in particular, right? So, um, uh, you know, Lycian and is really our, our best attested of the second millennium. Sorry, the first millennium. <laughs> The, the best attested of the first millennium BCE Anatolian languages. And I mean, we have bilingual Greek Lycian inscriptions and all kinds of things. It's clear that there was like, you know, much, much more intensive contact there. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's just uh, in that sense, I mean, it, it's clear that there would have been extensive influence for just simply limited by the amount of documentation uh, sure. that we have during that period. True. Well, thank you on that. Um, on a somewhat different tack, Sam asks, uh, in curiosity, what drew you to the very interesting field of Indo-European studies? Yeah, that was, so I was trained as a classicist. I was doing Latin and Greek and uh, at, at, I guess, yeah, at Berkeley. And um, I never really, I didn't really know anything or had, had ever heard of Indo-European. And I really liked studying these languages. I thought they were cool and interesting, but I knew I was not going to be a guy who writes about literature or, or, or history. Like that was, I was just, I mean, they're, I think they're super interesting, but it was never, I don't know, like I just didn't really see that as my trajectory. And so then I got introduced. Yeah, I guess basically the, you know, I, I, I kind of bumped into a few people who uh, eventually kind of put me onto the work of Cal Watkins. And Cal Watkins, like really like, it really like the, the place where, I mean, yeah, it's like so many Indo-Europeanists, this is the gateway drug is, you know, Cal Watkins, 1995, How to Kill a Dragon, like this, you know, where you can kind hit. of, I mean, <laughs> right, like it's so I mean, few it in, our, for a lot of us. in our field, but it was, and it is, and it's, 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 it's accessible, and it, may, it makes everything seem so cool and interesting, and, uh, and for me, you know, having done all this work on, uh, on early Greek poetry, which is always, for me, that was always like the coolest Greek, like I was always super interested in Homeric Greek, and uh, the, you know, Hesiod, Hesiod, I mean, Hesiod, you, so, you know, Watkins, Cal's like, look, you can see Hesiod, you know, uh, transmitting, you know, he, you know, ch uh, channeling these both Indo-European themes and Near Eastern influence. And those are the, you know, if you sort of like, oh, where is my work now? It's like Indo-European and Anatolian. And like, these are the two things and they meet in Hesiod. And, and I would say that that's kind of like what, what brought me into, um, what brought me into this field. And yeah, so basically, um, that, that was kind of the gateway drug. And I got a nice recommendation from a, a guy who is, I don't know if he's really in the field anymore, but he recommended University of Georgia if you want to go on and learn how to actually do Indo-European. And uh, if anyone here is looking, go to go on and go do Indo-European. Um, Jackson can testify to this also. It's really the best place to like build yourself a little, a little toolkit for, uh, or, uh, you know, get, get, your, get your feet under you for, for, for doing further mm -hmm. study of Indo-European. And Dr. Klein is still there doing the exact same things, as far as I know. He, he sure um, is. He's a, yeah, yeah, he's amazing. I'm going to be there in about a month. First what time for? in about 12 years. Uh, the Germanic Linguistics Annual Colloquium 2020. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, which was that supposed to happen two years ago. <laughs> oh, sorry. You know, it's funny. It's You said that, and I was... I should have seized that immediately that the day was wrong, but time has stopped for me. It's like a flat, yeah, I don't know. It's like a flat circle. I like I can. Uh, um, that's it. Are you giving a talk? Yeah, I'm, I'm the keynote for some reason. Oh, shit. Yeah, but I haven't been there so in you, like 12 years. So you're the big dog, actually. I've never given a keynote anywhere. So there, there you go. That's uh, uh, this may be the only time. <laughs> dang, that's that should be super fun. Well, say hi to, I mean, say hi to Jared and. Uh, yeah. and, uh, uh, and tell him to keep producing the next generation of students. This is, this is the key. So Georgia, yeah, they have this just, I mean, it's the best 
place to do. Uh, I mean, you can do a PhD there and it, it's great too, but, but, you know, Jackson and I both did MAs there and then you, you know, they kind of give you this really core foundation of, of, of sort of Indo-European and also philology of the older Indo-European languages. And you can, the world is your oyster after that. <laughs> I don't know, as long as I should say this, this academic, whatever this thing is that we, this academic zone is your oyster. If, if, if your world is ancient languages, it's, yeah, <laughs> it, it yeah. would be your oyster. Uh, it's a, an oyster with very few pearls. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, monetary or, or, you know, non-intellect, lots of intellectual pearls. But yeah. Yes. 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 That's well put. Um, <laughs> Thomas asks, uh, did the other Anatolian languages contribute a lot to historical linguistics if you take into account they already have Hittite? Or are those other Anatolian languages usually left in the background? Shit, this is where I'm going to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question, Thomas, and thank you for asking it. Um, so I think it's really important that we get, you know, uh, let me, maybe I'll start with this. Hittite is by far the best attested. I mean, we have something broadly on the order of, so the size of the corpus is usually reported in tablets and tablet fragments, something like 30,000. That's not a super useful number because these things can range in size and intactness and so on. Maybe there, let's say there's broadly on the order of 300,000 words of Hittite, which is already like kind of small. That's like put the Iliad and the Odyssey together. It's one and a half times that size. So it's, I mean, it's, you know, it's not bad for like an old, really old language, a really old stage of a language, but that's all of the language I have in Hittite. That's 300,000. Luvian after that comes in around about 25,000 total words. Uh, and then Lishin at maybe, I don't know, something on the order of 7,000 words. And then the rest are in, I don't know, you know, a thousand max. So it's like, it's, it's unsurprising that Hittite is the biggest contributor because it has by far just the most of it. Are there places where Luvian and the other languages force us to modify our picture of Proto-Anatolian in subtle ways? So the common ancestor of these Anatolian languages, we'll call that Proto-Anatolian. And we build up our picture primarily on the basis of Hittite. And then I think there are small ways in which this picture does need to be adjusted in view of the evidence uh, of some of the other languages of the other Anatolian languages. That's, so that's my, 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 my I guess maybe the, the overall takeaway is there's, I think it's really important, but I have yet to see a really clear case where, uh, where we learn something, uh, we learn something truly new from the other languages that we didn't know on the basis of it. Like, although there are important cases where, uh, where it really, confirm something that we mm. suspected on the basis of Hittite. Like a great example of this would be something like um, the use of the suffix, sorry, this is going to get a little weedsy, but the use of the suffix eh2 uh, as a marker for animate nouns. Um, this is the suffix eh2. This becomes associated with uh, a feminine marker in the, so the more familiar in European language for many people here. So this is the, I don't know, uh, you know, this is... Um, Latin ah, uh, right? Yeah, Latin ah, and, and Greek Greek ah. Although the, both in both cases it shows up surprisingly as um, as short, but you know in Sanskrit or something like you know you have male horse ashva versus female horse ash, uh, ashva <laughs> uh, with a with a long ah. That's that's eh too. So like it you know it um, it becomes associated with feminines. Anyway, all this to say is this this suffix is there as a marker of animate nouns in Hittite but it's very restricted. There's just, I mean, there's very few of these uh, versus in the minor Anatolian languages, it's much more productive. It seems like it's much more, you know, and it's really the, the minor language, finding this suffix in the minor languages, Lishin uh, in particular, actually, which is crucial because we can tell the difference between, um, uh, uh, Lishin is a language where we can distinguish between uh, A and O, the outcomes of Proto-European A and O, they don't, they basically fall together in most of the Anatolian languages, but in Lishan, they mm. stay distinct. And that's why Lishan was really crucial to finding this suffix because EH2 is going to come out A-like, just like in Latin and Greek. So, so Lishan was crucial. And uh, then we found a lot of examples of the suffix in Luvian, uh, which is confirmed again for Weedsy, but for anybody who's really into this, uh, things that don't show eye mutation or what's usually called eye mutation in, in, uh, in Luvic. So, um, so, but basically these are, uh, 
the, the combined weight of those languages really confirmed that that suffix is truly there in this function. And this has really big implications for, um, I mean, uh, you know, making sure that it has that function Anatolian has really big implications for how we understand the family generally. So, so they contribute, but again, a really like, like absolute case where it's like, oh, we've learned something totally new that we wouldn't have guessed on the basis of Hittite. I actually don't know of any, I can't come up with one. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but if anybody has an idea about one, um, you know, run it by me, I'm, I'm interested. Well, I'll ask, does Luvian not have somewhat clearer reflexes of the different laryngeals? Uh, I would say they're, it's, yeah, I would say it's broadly similar to Hittite. I'm trying to think if there's like a really clear one. I mean, they, Luvian loses more stuff, like, you know, mm. so uh, yeah, man. I would say, my answer to that, I, unless I'm forgetting something right now, my answer to that is no. But um, but uh, but I might be forgetting something. I don't think so, though. All right, so we can all hate Luvian and and Lishan. No, 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 come on. <laughs> no, no, Luvian is cool and interesting. And uh, look, and we're still, you know, it's it's it's. I mean, in some ways, it's kind of the frontier. It's like uh, it is a small-ish, cor you know, the corpus is still relatively small, but there's lots more to learn about it. There's lots more work to be done. I mean, this is like the they just wrapped up like a a just Luvic workshop. So I mean, it's Luvi and Lishan, the other kind of minor Italian languages in Spain this past weekend where people are kind of presenting exciting new research. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in understanding those in, in these languages. And I don't know, I think it's going to remain kind of a, a hot topic, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, to me, for me, I'll always be a, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, we build our picture on the basis of Hittite and then, you know, we, we kind of, um, build our basic picture and then uh, Luvian helps us modify and understand it in its crucial details. Although that, you know, there's nothing in principle that requires that. That's just how it's played out at least so far. Well, it makes perfect sense. I mean, Hittite is to Anatolian what Gothic is to Germanic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Except that it's also then also the biggest. <laughs> Think about it that way. So it's the oh, yeah, earliest. Yeah, okay. but it's also, that, so that's yeah. like Gothic, right? Like in principle, the other languages can add in a lot of ways, just by having so much more of it, right? Like there's right. so much like, more the other one. Like but literally like millions God. of words of Old Norse. Yeah. Right. Versus, Precisely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah, it's yeah. not a perfect analogy. You know, I, I try. Uh, yeah, I mean, Gothic is cool too. People should work on, yeah. Well, actually, I should say people should work on Gothic. Gothic, relative to the size of its corpus, I'm not sure if there's any more well studied language in the universe. Yeah, relative to how much is remaining, you may be right. Um, with the possible exception of actually like runic Norse. Uh, Maybe, yeah, 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 right. Like with these, the, the, or like the, the Feistos disc or something. No, or something it's like, like that, yeah, one, yeah. one little thing and a billion, right. a billion words of people uh, uh, well, writing on it. People get obsessed. I mean, these are cool riddles. Um, yeah. Let's see, Greg asks, uh, I'm interested in what we can say about how exactly grammatical gender as a grammatical feature arose in non-Anatolian Indo-European. Is this an innovation that seems to have happened in one specific place and time we can pin down? Are there facts about pre-grammatical gender Indo-Hittite that made gender as a feature more prone to arise? Big subject. That is a super, it's a super hard question. Uh, I can answer one piece of it, which is the between, so about when, when it, or when, well, okay. He said grammatical gender, uh, sorry, or she or she, I don't, sorry, I didn't know. But, right. um, when grammatical gender arose, I don't, so I don't think we can answer that for sure because as far back as we can possibly go in, uh, you know, with, within proto European, even internally doing some amount of internal reconstruction, there's always gonna be two genders. Like there's just no way of getting past that two genders that we have in Anatolian. Like, and as some kind of an animate category and a neuter category like that, that opposition is as old as Indo, you know, as old as Indo-European is. And I don't see how you get past that. The, the, the big one that people debate is this is when the feminine gender rose. And that's what I was just that EH2 thing is related to this problem. And the broad consensus now is that uh, the EH2 is, I think, actually probably the single most important piece of evidence for uh, a common innovation of the non-Anatolian languages. So mm -hmm. like, it's pretty clear, like Hittite does not have, Hittite and the other Anatolian languages do not have, they did not lose the feminine, uh, they inherited 
feminine gender. They, that was a, a feature that developed uh, after Anatolian split off from the rest of the family sometime in that prehistory. There's interesting debate about when exactly. For, to my mind, it would just be right after Anatolian, but there's some debate still about whether, uh, whether Tocharian, which is usually, usually, although less uniformly regarded as the second to split off from the rest of the family, this is Tocharian all the way out, you know, out in the West in the Tarim Basin, um, or sorry, sorry, all the way out in the East, but, but in, you know, like what, yeah, like the Tarim Basin of Western Afghanistan. The, uh, um, uh, yeah, there's a question of whether it developed before Tocharian split off too. Um, I, I, I'm, I fall in the, it was there in the prehistory of Tocharian camp, but this is disputed. Okay. Um, and then there was other things like about whether, whether it's particularly likely to arise or not, how exactly the feminine gender arose. So that's the one we can actually study within the history of the Indo-European languages. Um, to my mind, actually, this is one of the, one of the more interesting questions that people, that, that, that there's room to do it, cool research on. Many people seem to think that it, the, the key to this, and this is partially based on typology, is that it starts off in the pronominal system. So you would have had an early, you know, an early use in particular of that EH2 morpheme to start marking uh, distinctly, uh, distinctly uh, female reference. So like these, you know, high animacy, um, human females. Uh, and then it kind of spread throughout the system. But how exactly this, how it, the, sort of the details of this development um, are uh, are still very much open. Sure. Well, and I mean, it's so widespread in the classically known Indo-European languages, um, you know, that H2 suffix, which I guess I, I also think about, is, is it IH2 that's also an old feminine marker? Uh, IH2, like yes. Yeah, it looks old and it's there in Sanskrit. And, um, and there's two kind of two flavors of it. There's the IH2, the one that people call the Verki suffix. This may, so this would be like the ma- word for male wolf. Um, yeah, for, for um, male wolf would be uh, in Sanskrit is Verka. And the, the, and then the female one would be Verki. And if this is supposed to be there, by the way, those are both supposed to be there in Germanic. Like They're in the, Old Norse. Yeah, so they're in Old Norse, right? Like, yeah, you all use it. It's Ulver is the masculine word. And then Ulger is an right. extremely rare survival in Germanic of that feminine type, yeah. Precisely, so there's that one. And then there's also the type, so-called Devi suffix, which is the one that it's similar looking, but it ablots. So it has like, it shows up as IH2 or yeah. And this is, yeah, well, it, as I say, it says there in the Sanskrit word for goddess. Mm. Um, uh, pretty, pretty is the, is the kind of the locus classicus. Um, and yeah, so there's, there's those, there are those two suffixes. Um, we don't have those in Anatolian, or at least there's no no uh, definitive or clear cut evidence uh, for, the, for either of those in Anatolian. So this is a this is a oh sorry not that's, excuse me let me back up that's wrong. There's no clear cut uh, cl- clear cut evidence for um, uh, for the Devi one, the one that Avlats. Uh, Verki, we think we have one at least we think we have one example of it, and it's there in this um, uh, in this Hittite word, this adjective Naki, which means something like it's kind of like Sanskrit guru. It means something like, it can be like heavy, but also like revered or, uh, I don't know, weighty of dignity kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so, so it is there. So we, we have that, 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 that Verki suffix um, in, in Hittite, but not, uh, but we don't have any clear evidence yet for Devi. Interesting. Yeah, yeah there is some point. story in there that we just don't know how to tell yet. Yeah, yeah, no, it's hard. I don't know. I, some people, uh, some people, yeah, I mean, people, you know, it, there's something about that suffix that, I mean, everyone basically agrees that in one way or another, uh, the, the Davy suffix has to be a proto European um, of antiquity. And it just must have gotten lost in Anatolian, or, or at least we haven't discovered it yet. Mm. That would be the, yeah. Uh- all right, let's take a question from uh, Payson over here who says, can we talk about the sea people? Uh, who do you think they were? And what about the Libyans? Uh, the last, uh, the, what about the Luvian part? I'm not sure. Well, that may have been uh, asked totally... before you started talking about Luvians a little bit. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, there's an interesting thing, right? So, okay. So you have the famous sea peoples, right? These are 
supposedly, so there's this big date in antiquity. The usual date is 1177 BCE, but whether or not it's that exact date is the crucial one. <coughs> Basically all around the Mediterranean, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, all, and yeah, even, even I mean, the Western Mediterranean, or, you know, in Greece and uh, on Crete and, and Mycenae, um, you see this like collapse of all of these, all of these, uh, of the sort of the superpower civilizations that were there, like all right at that, all that time, right? And that moves you in out of the late Bronze Age into the, the you know, the so-called Dark Ages of Anatolia. And the Sea Peoples are usually implicated among the among the factors that caused this so you see you have these people you don't really actually get any reference to them as sea peoples in Hittite I think that the actual sea peoples the only direct references come from I think it's Egyptian sources mm. um but but yeah there's this there's this <laughs> clear uh yeah I mean there's clearly you know turmoil happens at this period and and then there's this big question of what exactly are the causes of this massive civilization collapse and uh you know the, these are going to remain debate so people you know the sea peoples are often always brought into so these the ideas these would have been yeah like you know um some group of people traveling around on boats perhaps themselves already refugees from somewhere else that were kind of moving in and were one but it, it, it kind of seems to as far as i understand uh the debate it kind of seems to me like the sea peoples are already like the, you know whoever these people were and i and i don't know who that is uh they were already people who were being pressed by whatever conditions gave rise to this uh to this broader you know the, the broader set of conditions in the area that were they were probably already people who were you know being pushed out of wherever they had been living uh mm -hmm. and and on the move and trying to you know um uh trying to resettle uh, uh somewhere else and they ended up kind of being intrusive into the, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of the ancient Near East broadly. But that so, designation, um, Sea Peoples, yeah. is, is exocentric. It comes from outside whoever these peoples are. So there's nothing to indicate. That's right. You know, yeah. what and, language they yeah. spoke or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, maybe they also, yeah, I try to remember, at the moment, I'm kind of blanking on, I, I saw that someone posted the Sea Peoples link. It's probably right there on the page. But where the actual term Sea Peoples, like in which of the, which of the, uh, uh, yeah, from which of our, from which of our sets of sources does that actually come from? And I, I can't remember the answer to that right now, but, but yeah. It is, Egyptian. it is the Egyptian sources. Yeah. The, the date 11, yeah. So I was about to, this, this thing, I was just about to recommend this, so the, like this book, uh, by Eric Klein, 1177 BC. There was a new edition um, recently in recent-ish, really actually quite recent, because I was just looking at it and he and he revised it, I think, during the pandemic. So it's it's got to be, you know, very recent and tries to incorporate all of the latest evidence. And I think it's a really nice synthesis. So people then argue, you know, the, the factors that get invoked in this are like natural disasters, and things like earthquakes and drought. You know, there's a big movement I mean, there's, there seems to be energy behind trying to say that there's some kind of climate change going on in this region. And then, then there's the further question, is that really, you know, is the, is the climate change really, you know, related to these uh, uh, natural disasters? And like, there's all these different kinds of causes that seem to have played a role. It, my, I read the book not so long ago and I remember that, yeah, you know, it's clear that there were some kinds of um, a drought and and uh, and and you know the Hittites. It's pretty clear we're experiencing um, kind of grain shortages in the in the run up to this. So you see them writing to Egypt, where everybody's always going to you know all of history. People are getting their grain from Egypt. Um, this is of course they did this for Rome and, and so on. So it's uh, uh, so yeah. There's clearly like the conditions were were deteriorating in the run up to this period, and so. Uh, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, it seems like there were a, a multifactorial explanation for, for what is going on in that period broadly. And the Sea Peoples were, were some kind of a factor, but whether they were more cause or just, I don't know, part of the, you know, the experience of it, I think is hard to say. Mm. And then the Luvians, sorry, let me, let me just, because I just want to pick up on just that Luvian spread. The Luvians... Uh, the, the, the thing that's interesting about Luvian is that uh, 
you end up so in the in the in the in the period after this, like starting in the Iron Age after 1000 BCE, you find these um, so-called neo-Hittite states, but these are all these are all being run by uh, people who identify kind of culturally as Hittites, or or yeah uh, yeah I mean they associate themselves with like Hittite ruling dynasties, but they're actually all Lubian speaking, and uh, uh, yeah and. Uh, and these, you know, these crop up, but yeah, I mean, starting, you know, they become very, you know, they, they start dominating all kind of sort of, yeah, like Northern Syria. Um, uh, we have all of these, you know, hieroglyphic Luvian inscriptions and so on. There are all these like, you know, neo, yeah, Neo-Hittite states, they call them. And, uh, and what's interesting about them in this respect to this collapse that I'm talking about is that actually it's pretty clear that they didn't wholly collapse, like the transition between like the kind of Hittite empire uh, up to the you know the early twelfth early twelfth century um, uh, BCE, you know this this radical collapse. People are kind of revising this now and seeing more continuity than before because actually we're starting to get or we're it's starting to become more and more clear that there are actually Luvian inscriptions, especially in kind of northern Syria, uh, all throughout that period, like you know in the twelfth and eleventh centuries um, BCE, and so like. To the extent that at least some of these smaller these kingdoms were not affected or, or not I shouldn't say not affected but they didn't you know there was not it was not a complete collapse in the way that it was sort of traditionally imagined so you see this kind of continuity between these two things and and this is a kind of I don't know this is a, a thing people are doing a lot of interesting research on now well and that makes sense and, and I, I can see how some of the uh, designation of it as a big collapse event is a little bit uh, helicentric Right, where in Greece you see this dramatic, um, seeming end of the Mycenaean civilization, and uh, several centuries later, the the rise of a, a new Greek civilization with a new alphabet. And, yeah, and, and, and yeah. we may have more. And I think Egyptian too. Egyptian Anatolia. has there's a lot of there's a lot of problems. There's like I mean there's really like evidence for a significant change, and also in yeah, and also in the Akkadian sources too. So it's like it's okay. it is pretty widespread, but Luvian. Uh, yeah, Luvian, there was, there's more evidence for continuity than we previously thought, but that there was like a really pretty uh, massive downturn in, in, in the fates of all of the major uh, superpowers in that area up to that point is, is clear. I mean, that's like, hmm. that's definitely there. So, so the, you know, there, there's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's always, it's, it's a question of degrees, you know, right. <laughs> you know, how, how much we want to go back and, but yeah, to speak of, yeah, I mean, this is always, you know, we, we go back and we revise these things and we say that there are subtleties that uh, were missed in the, in, the, in the earlier versions. I'll, let's see, Frank asks, uh, this might be a touch outside the general scope of this conversation, but I've been wondering about the theory that the Germanic languages uh, were learned incompletely at some point in their development by a non-Indo-European language speaking group. Is there any way we can examine that idea more in depth? Is there evidence of that sort of radical language shift in other Indo-European or Anatolian languages? So, uh... that's is yeah, substitute hypotheses are really super hard to evaluate. Um, I don't know. You, I mean, look, you probably know more about the, the you know, the nature of this Germanic uh, evidence. I know that they're like, I don't know. There's kind of famous arguments about uh, uh, by by yeah, certain certain prominent individuals about um, about Germanic uh, yeah. being having learned by like Basque speakers. I think like a Basque substrate. This is an idea. There's, and, there's so many yeah. different versions of this that I'm pretty sure there's someone out there who's published about the Martian substrate in Germanic. I mean, yeah. I've seen, I've seen two dozen different versions of this, you know, personally, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you think about Hittite and, and Hurrian. And I'll, I'll just quickly mention, I don't see a ton of reason to think that there is a ton of substrate influence on Germanic, or if there is, how do you isolate what substrate influence and what's just regular language change you know one one thing people point to is that mobile accent of indo-european which you were talking about earlier 
becomes fixed on the first syllable in Germanic. And it's a really distinctive feature of Germanic. Is that because- Oh, well, is it though? <laughs> I mean, it's distinctive, but it's also there in the other, like it's also, we also get an italic, early italic, early sure. Celtic, like it seems but to be like a, a Western, yeah. But it's a very distinctive thing that happens in the transition to Germanic is, like, is, is what I'm mm. saying. And so people have pointed that as well, this is because of some substrate speaking a language that has strong stress on the first syllable is learning an Indo-European language. But I don't see, I mean, as you pointed out, it's not limited to Germanic. Uh, it's certainly mm. not limited to, you know, it, it's, it's not an unusual change. Um, it doesn't have to be substrate. And then some of the vocabulary people point to in Germanic as being supposedly unexplainable from within Indo-European. Isn't that unexplainable? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so like ship is one of the classic examples where it's not related to any word in any other branch that means you know, ocean going vessel, but it could well mm. be from a root that means split. And if you're making boats out of split logs, then it's not that yeah. crazy of a semantic shift. To go. So I haven't yeah. seen any reason to, to get too excited about a Germanic substrate hypothesis, but what do you think with regard to Hittite and Hurrian perhaps? Yeah. I, I mean, right. So that's a, like, it's a really good example because like they're, they're clearly, I mean, we can call it, you know, we, we call it, whether you want to call it a substrate or not, like, I think it's like, I mean, it, almost, almost everyone now agrees the Anatolian languages are intrusive to, to Anatolia, right? So, you know, it's, I mean, there's lots of questions of when exactly, probably sometime in the third millennium BCE, and then which direction they came from, like, you know, did they come from the Pernambian homeland over the Caucasus or through the Balkans or like, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's these issues, but everyone agrees they're intrusive. And so, you know, like they've been, they hang out with all of these other non-Indo-European languages and the number of features that seem like they need an explanation in, I mean, they're there like for thousands, I mean, you know, say, let's say a minimum, a minimum number of years there between our, like the earliest observed, you know, our earliest attestations of these languages for sure being there and say, like how, when they, they enter Anatolia, like it would be minimum on of, 300 years or so, uh, or four, three or 400 years. And it could be considerably more than that. And there's like almost nothing that we really need to explain that really requires, you know, in terms of like really structural properties of the languages that really demands an explanation uh, in terms of, you know, substrate or abstrate effects. Like we don't need any of that to explain how we, how the languages work. Well, there are definitely like loan words and stuff like that's not, you know, no, no questions. Like, um, but even those are not as rich on the ground as you might expect, uh, given given how long they were there. So, so I guess my feeling is, um, uh, insofar as the Anatolian languages say anything about this question, you know, you can actually have a, you can, you know, languages can be uh, extremely stable, uh, even in uh, uh, these kinds of, uh, you know, in a in a in a situation where there it, where there are substantial non indo european you know, populations that could have in principle in influenced them. True. And it can be hard to predict that. I mean, you look at languages that have borrowed so much of their lexicon from somewhere else, like Armenian vis-a-vis -vis Iranian languages. It's like, why? When there's plenty of other languages that were that much in contact with another language and didn't borrow that much. You know, that doesn't seem yeah. to be any way to create a theoretical framework for why and how that kind of thing happens. Not that I suspect I know, like there, yeah, I mean, you know, there's all these, there's, you know, extremely rich literature on the sociolinguistics of different kinds of contact and like the particular Armenian type. I, I don't know, perhaps that's, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not, not a total non-expert on this, but you know, you can imagine that this kind of uh, from the top type doesn't lend itself well towards keeping, uh, towards keeping the, the, the native lexicon. But, um, but yeah, I, yeah, I mean, we, we really simply don't have that kind of evidence for, um, for Hittite, and I don't think we do for early Germanic. It's just it's way too long. It's way too long of a period. Like you know, the earliest attestation would would follow the the you know the, the, the contact with the substrate languages by so much, right? Yeah, by thousands of years. So. Yeah, it's like what would you? How, how would you? Yeah, how I, I don't even know how you would prove it. And and to my I mean, and maybe your impression is the same. It's like what in Germanic is so weird that demands an explanation in those terms? Like that can't be just. Yeah, and it's not that weird. There's most of what distinguishes Germanic is changes that you can find elsewhere. Um, 
But, uh, you know, of course, you could always go all grim on it and say that it's because proto-Germanic speakers were breathing that alpine air and that, <laughs> and that changed that and that changed other so <laughs> that's why i'm undergoing a sec uh you know uh a, a second grimm's law in colorado right it's that that mountain air that changes one's language that's right yeah yeah, yeah. i would you to you know there are these these things are not like yeah these like naturalistic explanations they're really hard and you know the the, the like yeah the I mean, the, 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 these classic versions of them are, of course, like silly and, and kind of almost so absurd as to be fun. But I don't know. You know, I reviewed a paper. Uh, or I, I, yeah, no, I know. I mean, I read and I guess I, I, I talked about a paper that was published in, I don't know, one of those big journals. Not, I don't think it was Nature, but it was like Science or something. You know, one of the big, one of these super high budget publications where they argued that like, the development of fricatives in the Indo-European languages had something to do with like changes in the anatomy of their of the speakers' mouths as they switched from yeah like as they switched from like you know primarily uh, pastoralist type diets that include more I think like meat or something to like primarily like agricultural diets and they were like oh this could have played like a partial a partial role in explaining how how the why, you know why it is the case that the, the Indo-European languages as we have them, uh, lots of them have fricatives, but for Proto-Indo-European, all we have are, well, yeah, you know, S plus the laryngeals. Um, and by the way, the laryngeals for, were, were definitely fricatives for anyone who's wondering in the audience. There's, there's some confusion um, being spread uh, about this <laughs> in the literature, but they were, they were definitely fricatives. <laughs> I'm still recovering from the notion that there was that much significant anatomical change 5,000 years ago. Well, no, 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 this would be, yeah, yeah, or like yeah. within 5,000 years. <laughs> they claim that like this shift in, I mean, yeah, the, you know, the, yeah, okay, there's the link. The, wow, this is very impressive to see these things just pop up. Um, Still is great at finding the stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I gave a comment, I think, on this in the, for the Atlantic. That was like, that's the, that was the highest profile thing I'd ever done uh, up to that, up Fancy. to, up to my last interview with you, I guess, that, you know, that's. <laughs> That's, that's now my most impactful work. So here we are. Well, your, your oeuvre on the Crawford Channel only grows. Uh, soon the, uh, the Davos invitations will be arriving. Um, all right. You, are you still good to go with some questions and such? Are you yeah, I'm, I'm, at, I'm, at your, I'm at your disposal. Sure. All right. Uh, Thomas asks, what's something in Anatolian studies that you think is really understudied? You might have, might have touched on this a little bit, but yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, in some sense, it kind of feels like the uh, the next frontier on on for doing Indo-European language. I mean, this has been true, I think, for thirty years, but I think it's still true. The next frontier for doing comparative Indo-European historical linguistics uh, uh, is doing doing syntax, basically, and now people are. And I think this is true for the Anatolian languages and people are, um, uh, people are starting to do the work now. Like, you know, you can talk about the work of like guys like, um, well, yeah, P PhD students at UCLA, like, uh, like Matthias Huggard some years ago and uh, Thomas Motter and, and now in, and outside of UCLA, people like um, uh, Andre Sedeltsev is a, an important one, Petra, uh, Petra Hudehabara at the University of Chicago, like people doing, doing the hard work of kind of trying to sort out the, the syntax of, of these languages. And, um, uh, and so I would say that, yeah, that basically um, uh, uh, philologically informed and, and theoretically rigorous uh, syntactic investigation of the Anatolian languages uh, would go hand in hand with the same kind of study in a lot of the older, other older European languages. And you know, putting together them, putting together these pieces into uh, into uh, a really concrete theory of how of how the syntax uh, syntax and morphosyntax of the European of Proto-European work. Um, this is yeah. This I say this still remains the next frontier. And it's been only very slowly gathering steam over the past couple of decades. I mean, actually, the last time mm -hmm. I was in Athens was in 2009 for uh, Dutcher Klein's Indo-European Syntax Conference. Oh, uh, yeah right so I yeah. mean, it, he was thinking about this 13 years ago um and in fact my my thesis grew out of that that interest of his um hmm. looking at the syntax of of 
uh, the first translation of the New Testament into Icelandic. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, hmm. you know, you're right though. That, that, that probably is the big expanding horizon. Just the tools are hard to get. You really have to be, to really study the syntax of these languages. I mean, well, not only do you them. need all of this. Yeah, but that's what I mean. You really have to know them super, super well. And yeah, and it, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's harder than studying. It's much, much harder than studying the syntax of a modern language or a yeah, living language where you have native speakers. So, and that's really hard too. So it's like, yeah. uh, you know, you kind of have to have a really um, powerful, powerful toolkit at your disposal. And so it's, it's not, it's, it's completely unsurprising that it, you know, that it's taking a long time, but, um, but it's moving. And so, yeah. uh, and so, you know, there's, there's lots of, I mean, look, there's lots more room and this is the only place, you know, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of interesting work to be done in tolling languages to still remain one of our less well understood branches. And, uh, you know, it's, it's cool because it's old. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to, uh, 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 you know, to, to see, to see uh, inherited features and, and maybe even things that are, you know, uniquely preserved in, in the older Anatolian languages. Um. Actually, Frank has a question that might kind of flow into some of this. Um, on an un unrelated side note, I've heard there are a myriad of untranslated Hittite inscriptions and that they may contain the Trojan War story, but from the other side. Is there any truth to that? Uh, there's little. So basically for Hittite, all of the texts that all of the like large texts, like, you know, I mean, there's lots of we have lots and lots of little little itty bitty bits of like so these these things come down to us on clay tablets right and these things can break and shatter into a million smithereens and so you have like little tiny you know fragments of hittite that'll have like one word on them or something lots of those we can't like you know could one of those be a small piece of the missing trojan war story maybe maybe but as far as like yeah big big continuous text these are all like we've pretty much all of these have been published that we have found. It's also possible that much more, you know, I mean, it's not impossible that of course, like we could somehow get very lucky and, and turn up a whole new trove of Hittite texts. Mm. But unless that happens, then the answer to this question is no, because, um, because everything that, you know, every, every substantial text that exists, we have, you know, published editions and translations of, and, and they don't, they don't do that. I mean, we have these just tantalizing bits. Like, so the most famous of these is in one of these, we have this set of Hittite texts where um, uh, these, these tend to be kind of like, yeah, like, like ritual texts or yeah, they, it's all sometimes associated with festivals, particular festivals of, uh, in, you know, in, in, in the Hittite cities and, uh, and, and the cults of particular gods and goddesses. And so you'll get like, there's one famous one where we have uh, um, uh, in a Hittite context, you have uh, just a tiny bit of Luvian. So it's, it's basically a cue in this particular context for um, some performers to come, you know, on, uh, on stage, but as part of this part of this ritual performance to sing a song and they're going to sing this song in Luvian. And they say, uh, let me see if I can just remember the text. Ahada, uh, yeah, uh, Ahada, Alati, Awienta, Wilusati when they came from maybe far off, maybe steep, something, Willusa. And this is like Willusa is, you know, supposedly that's Ilion or Troy. Mm -hmm. And so we have like the first line of this thing that could in principle be like some kind of a Luvian epic poem. This is what Cal Watkins suggested. Could be a, like a Luvian epic poem about the, the Trojan War story. Right. But all we have is that one line. That's it. That's the right. only thing we have. We just have, you know, it's just a cue in this in this performance that they know they sing that well-known song about Bilusa. But we don't have the rest of the song, which is like, of right. course, we would love to have that. May, you know, who knows? But, you know, maybe someone wrote that down somewhere, but but not. We don't have it. So, um, you know, there's tantalizing suggestions like that such a thing existed, but yeah, it's it's not it's not you know unless we find a whole bunch more that text, it's certainly not going to turn up to us. Right. Uh, I seem to remember there were a couple questions on Patreon and the threads uh, about this announcement. So let me check uh, real quick and see if there's any of those I could throw at you. Uh, Johan Petter had asked, what is the current best bet of a sister family to Indo-European? 
Uh, Small question. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Uh, it's um. There's a big push in um. Uh, for Indo-Uralic for some people. So you can find there's a recent volume of articles to this effect, uh, edited by. Uh, I think it's it's in that. Uh, this is like Klukerst and Pronk, the two two Leiden guys, two Leiden scholars. Uh, two scholars from the University of Leiden. And so you can, uh, th th yeah, th there seems to be a big movement towards trying that uh, in a completely direct, in, in a different direction. Uh, there's a couple of books, which people in our field haven't, uh, maybe I, <laughs> it's hard to know how, what to do with these exactly, because they're written by a, a very serious linguist, Juliet Blevins. She has these, this book and a book and then a follow-up article about a connection between uh, Proto-Indo-European and Basque. Um, which, you know, uh, if, if, Juliet Ble if Juliet Blevins is doing something, it should be taken very seriously. And our field hasn't really, I don't know, I haven't, you know, I, ha I haven't seen this paid as much attention as probably it should be. So that, that's an interesting possibility, but how that would fit into this picture of that or Uralic, I don't know. To my, to my, I don't deal with these questions because they're too far removed from the data. Like I just, I, it, it, it's too hard to say for, for me, that's never been the most, these have never been the most interesting questions. You know, it's all about like, I'm really interested in these languages. I'm interested in language change. I, I like to be able to work closer to the text where you can say things in a more concrete way and actually make falsifiable hypotheses, which is like, to my mind, it's just not really possible at these extremely deep time depths. Yeah. Well, and, and if I'll, I'll throw a little bit in at the end of that, um, which is that I think there's some pretty intriguing little parallels that one can find between a reconstructed Proto-Uralic and a reconstructed Proto-Indo-European. But mm -hmm. I just don't think that you can, you, you just can't say for sure in the way that you say, you know, here, look, Hittite is clearly an Indo-European language. If these language frameworks are connected, it goes back so far that yeah. you might never be able to reconstruct what the last common ancestor of them was. Yeah, precisely. And so not, then- Not with predictive power. Right, so then it becomes an interesting question for like people who are interested, you know, in, in yeah, the, the prehistory of populate. I mean, it becomes a question for archeologists and, and anthropologists. And and I think it's an interesting question. I, I would love to hear what, what they make of that, but like, I don't know, I'm, I'm just not sure that comparative linguistics can really, I mean, you know, if there were really compelling archeological evidence for one, you know, or, or, or yeah, this, this, that kind of evidence for one of these hypotheses, or maybe some of this new DNA stuff, I don't know, there's like this big, you know, like, let's get the DNA evidence, uh, build this into our picture. Um, you know, maybe we could weigh in and, and add our little, you know, uh, add, add some small amount of evidence that tip that helps tip the scales in one direction or another, but hmm. As a linguist, like these are, I don't know, like the, the, yeah, there's too much uncertainty to, for me to ask the kind of questions that I'm interested in at that, at that level. Yeah, I'm, I'm where you're at on that. Um, Frank asks a, a, a follow-up to the substrate question. Are there actually any good examples of a substrate language? Or is it just one of these kinds of hypotheses that pop up and stick around in the popular imagination? I mean, no one, but I don't think, if I can start off quick on this, yeah. I, I don't think anyone's denying that substrate and superstrate languages influence one another. The question is, are, is it such a, has it made such a big difference in the history of some historical Indo-European language family branch like Germanic or Anatolian or, or, or what have you? Um, yeah. You know, uh, superstrates, substrates, uh, th this is a real thing in the history of a language. Like for in example, uh, English had uh, superstrate of Norman French for a long time. And that left quite a signature in our, our lexicon. Um, but I don't think that you can argue that Germanic was clearly that to some other non-Indo-European language at some point in its past. It's just not, it's not documentable. There's not enough there. Uh, that's not what you would expect from just development from Indo-European that you need that substrate to explain. What, what would you say? I agree with that. No, no, I, I think that that's the right answer. I mean, right. We, I mean, we, you know, from like, you know, more, much more modern and recent studies of, of languages that are in contact that like that, yeah, that, that substrate effects broadly are real. It's just whether these can offer uh, explanatory power into uh, features of old European languages. And um, 
I don't, you know, I don't, I don't. Uh... Well, I mean, I don't know. It's yeah. I mean, okay. A good example of one that's like an older New European language that clearly has had, uh, I mean, again, I don't, I don't want to say substrate exactly, but like the effect of the, you know, of the local languages uh, on its structure in a significant way would be Tocharian, right? Like you have all mm -hmm. of this, um, you have these extensive, like uh, sort of, I don't know, kind of like, um, broadly like agglutinative like like uh like they call them the secondary cases in tocharian you have all of these like you know uh, kind of accretions to the end mm -hmm. of uh, inherited in, you know inflection and um and this seems to be an aerial feature of you know uh, of the languages that are surrounding it like, like turkic languages and so on so it's like th there's pretty clear evidence for that kind of thing um but uh, but yeah, I mean, for Anatolian, I don't really, I, I don't know about it. I mean, so for, if, you know, just to, like, confine this Anatolian where I really have like, you know, uh, uh, real, real competence, I, I, the amount of, the amount of stuff that needs explanation in terms of, yeah, a kind of substrate is, a non indo European substrate is vanishingly small, like maybe one or two things. And, and by the way, I think something really similar to what you're talking about with Tocharian happened in Baltic, uh, probably from contact with Finnic. So yeah, that, probably. that kind of thing. But, we'll yeah. yeah. Uh, here's yeah. another one that was that was sent in on the announcement post. Uh, Johan Peter asked, uh, "What are the what values are the laryngeals most likely to have had?" Uh, you you hinted you were yeah. going to get close to this earlier. What, what what's your thinking on this right now? Yeah, um, H one is H, <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> or a voiceless. Yeah, um, that's H one. And, um, uh, and that one is the one that is, yeah, I mean, they're all, they're all to some extent disputed, but I think that this, the broad consensus, the, 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 I would say that the weight of the opinion is that that is the right reconstruction of it. And I, I think that that, for me, that one is the alternative is a glottal stop. And for me, I come down pretty strongly on the, on the age side. Um, but, you know, basically one, it had to be one of those two things because it gets lost without a trace in virtually every language. And those are the two things right. that get lost without a trace. Um, but, but to my mind, um, H, H works much better. It, um, to my mind, the laryngeals are pretty clearly fricatives from a phonological, from a phonological perspective, they pattern with the biggest thing that they do is they pattern with S with respect mm. to perturbative and root structure constraints. And like that, that is the strongest argument for them being, um, fricatives. Uh, like this is just huge. And I don't see any way around this. Like I just, uh, yeah. I think any phonologist would look at this and say that that's the obvious, that's the obvious uh, uh, piece of, that's the obvious analysis of this phonological fact, which is to my mind, like an irreducible fact. Like you cannot go backwards in the prehistory and explain that in some way. Um, this is like a, a really irreducible uh, a property of the uh, uh, structural property of, of Indo-European languages. So um, H would be, yeah, well, that, <laughs> well, sorry. It's something that you want to voice it somehow to pronounce it, but yeah, a voiceless H. Um, yeah, voiceless throttle for good. Uh, the H2 and H3, the ones that we actually find continental reflexes of an Anatolian, um, to my mind, are uh, pretty clearly uvular fricatives. Uh, exactly what the values are that distinguish them, I would just say that H2 is a, a voiceless uvular fricative. And then what you do with H3, it's got to be different from H2. Uh, the evidence is so, so, so limited, right? So the, like the, the sometimes people, I mean, the natural reconstruction would be to say it's the voice equivalent. So it would be, uh, you know, beside ha, huh, it would be ha, huh. uh, uh, it would be the voice, sorry, these are both terrible because like, I've voiced the first one again. It's something about pronouncing it like right here that makes oh, no. you want to voice it. So oh, no. yeah. It's, it's hard. Versus ha, huh. uh, possibly. You feel the Um, uh, but yeah, but then there's, you know, so the, the, there's just really just one piece of evidence in all of the Indo-European languages for, uh, for the voicing effect. And that would be, um, uh, you know, so this, this, uh, um, Sanskrit pibati and, and Latin bibo and things like this, where that B, the, the, the second, the, the B that's there in Sanskrit, and then, uh, kind of by a secondary property in Latin, also the first B, that this would somehow be the result of a P and an H3 next to each other. 
and mm. it would have voiced it. That's, that's basically it <laughs> for the evidence. Um, uh, but yeah, it's got to be different from H2. The voicing seems like a natural reconstruction. Other people propose other features. It's a big debate, but but to my mind that they're, uh, yeah, uvular fricatives is pretty, pretty clear. Um, uh, there's lots of, I mean, there's a lot, there's a whole, I mean, there's a whole huge uh, range of evidence that I think would probably take us too far afield to discuss. Um, in, Anatol in the Anatolian languages, even, we find some evidence from things like uh, loan words into other Near Eastern languages that um, point in favor of, uh, point in favor of a uvular a uvula oh, fricative reconstruction. Um, <laughs> like uh, Michael Weiss has a nice paper on this. Um, uh, it's called something like, uh, yeah, the name of Cilicia and, I don't know, and fricative, and, and uvulars or something. The, the name of Cilicia and the, and the laryngeals or something. I, 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 could, I could pull up the reference if people are interested, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it, I, to my mind, the case here is, Pretty clear. Is it, po it could it, is it conceivable that at some point um, these things had slightly different values? Maybe they went underwent. Michael Weiss suggests that maybe they went underwent a shift and became uh, from uvular to um, uh, pharyngeal, which is typologically known before they kind of then got lost in all of the other non-Anatolian languages. Yeah, sure, maybe um, this seems this seems uh, like a, a, a known trajectory. So. So that might've happened too, but yeah, for me, the likeliest features for Proto-Indo-European would be, yeah, voiceless glottal fricative, voiceless uvula, uh, voiceless uvula fricative, and I, yeah, why not voice uvula fricative, but like- well, And, and to clarify for those who may not uh, have as much background with this, that the, the question is there's these three consonants that we know <laughs> were there in Proto-Indo-European, and but we don't know for sure what they sounded like because the only traces of them as consonants are actually from Anatolian. And it's only uh, H2 and H3 there. Even, oh, right, we don't right. even, even there, we don't have H1. So it's like, uh, right. yeah. Even that is, is inferred uh, from uh, the system. So we, we just label them H1, H2, H3. And so there's been a long question of what did these actually sound like? Um, uh, that and, is the correct reference for anyone who's looking at the chat. Yeah, the, still found um, it, yeah. The, that's, yeah, that's the one. But in most other Indo-European languages besides Anatolian, the only traces of them are the effects that H2 and H3 have on vowels that had preceded them. Yes, so, also, but also on vowels that follow. So like, yeah, vowels, vowels that precede, you get length and uh, changes in quality so to O or A, uh, but it, you, yeah, you all, for vowels that follow them, you'll also get changes just in the quality. But yeah, yeah, right. you've got that. Yeah, I, right. I, uh, I neglected to mention that, but that's also, that's where you get a lot of uh, the A uh, and O vowels in early Indo-European is from E's that were changed by following or preceding laryngeals. Yes, I we still call them laryngeals. This is, why you're the, this is why you're the host of these things. This is why you're the host because that's a really nice, clear explanation. And I just jumped right into the, uh, uh, the, too, deep, the too deep weeds. Oh no, I just thought it was it was worth pausing a moment to explain what why this is such an interesting question. And of course, the name laryngeal has just stuck for you know mm -hmm. like a hundred years without us ever having really known that they were laryngeals or what exactly they were. Um, yeah, I mean, no one wants to commit to the values. I mean, I think yeah, you know, I mean, lots of people, some people don't even really, I don't know, believe in I, I, Cal Watkins is a famous example. He didn't really view, he kind of viewed these as uh, kind of algebraic, you know, reconstructions. It's not so much we're reconstructing a kind of natural, natural language uh, that, you know, I mean, we're, these are, these kind of are stand-ins for the, uh, for, you know, it kind of doesn't matter what the, what the properties are, but I, I think this is not quite right. I mean, you know, we, what we assume for the values of these segments will guide how we understand their development in the, in the, you know, in the languages, you know, what kind of segments are prone to loss under what conditions, like, I don't know, you know, there's this famous, famous, I don't know, one of the reasons that people are pretty, you know, now, now came around to this, uh, uh, you know, uvular or pharyngeal reconstruction of the, um, uh, of the laryngeals was like that, you know, you, you observe that in palatalization context, these things um, tend to get, uh, tend to get zapped they tend to get deleted. This goes under the, the name of, uh, yeah, one of, one of the examples of this would be, yeah, this goes under the name of Pinot's law in Indo-European. Um, 
Uh, and there's nice work on this by Andrew, Andrew Bird, uh, formerly of UCLA. Uh, so yeah, it, you know, th these are the, they do feed into, you know, debates about the rest of the, about how the language, you know, about the reconstruction and also then how the language is developed. So yeah, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's a nice, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a debate that's worth having, I think. Now we'll actually have Andrew Bird on here uh, sometime in the next couple of months. I've talked ah. to him about coming on here. So Good. Be... He's much more charming and he will produce these. He will not uh, screw up on his first attempt to produce all of these sounds. He's really um, a good, <laughs> really excellent phonetician and, and uh, uh, is called on regularly to produce sounds. Whereas I, yeah, well, yeah, I try to all avoid right. it. <laughs> um, so we're taking about an hour and a half of your time here. How are you doing? Do you want to? We could do like like five more minutes and then call okay. it. Does that sound good? I don't know. Right. I mean, I don't. I was. I, you never really told me how long you wanted this thing to go on for. Because I didn't. I didn't have a notion. I. I just thought we'd ask you questions for as long as you take them. Uh, but yeah. We know you're once my man. kids are in bed. Well, once my kids are in bed, you know, it's not so bad. But um. But yeah, let's let's we can do a few more minutes and then uh, and call it. Okay. Uh, well, another question from someone who's here, uh, Drew says, what kind of text would be most intriguing for you personally, if ever discovered? Uh, kind of a wishful thinking type question, but curious what you'd get most excited about. God, what would I get most excited about? That is a, that is a hell of a question. Um, yeah, what do we most want for all of Hittite? It's going to be Hittite. It's always Hittite. Uh, the Hittite Gilgamesh, or does that exist? I mean, yeah, if you had a complete, yeah, that'll be cool. Uh, it would be a Hittite, yeah. I guess I, I, I do, you know, I've, I've found myself, I really like Hittite myths, and so yeah, God, a single tech, yeah, it's hard to even imagine because, like, what are what are the things you know what? I mean, the obvious answer to this is, uh, if we had. <laughs> Whatever the hell was in that Willusiad or whatever, whatever exactly that, whatever lived under that, whatever lived under that line, that might be the most interesting text in, uh, in you know, in all of Anatolian and maybe all of Indo-European. That would be so cool, right? I mean, who knows what it is? I mean, do I think it's an epic poem that lives under there? Probably not. It would be weird to have an epic poem in the middle of a ritual, but like you could have something like a, you know, something more like a, a you know, a Pindar, a Pindar style kind mm -hmm. of know uh, uh you know a pindaric hymn slash you know similar stuff this similar the hymns you see of the rig veda that could give us some real i don't know insight into the you know the, the i mean yeah if it talks about the trojan war from the anatolian side that would be super neat but yeah. yeah i agree that would be pretty pretty rocking yeah but single I text I yeah, I, I, yeah that would be amazing that would be so cool um Is is there a Hittite translation of Gilgamesh? I, I guess I threw that out there as just sort of a... I mean, Gilgamesh is the right, like the story is going across, all across the North, across the Near East. And so there's little bits of, yeah, there's, there's, yes, there's, there's Hittite material that's relevant. I mean, we have, that's cool. yeah. But, that's cool. Um, I figured the story probably got to them. I just didn't know if there was a full version of it that existed in Hittite. No, not a full version. I mean, no one, I mean... <laughs> I don't think we don't have it. I don't think we, you know, we don't have a full version of it in any, in any oh, tradition. Well. Right. But, but, uh, but yeah, no, not definitely not. It, 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 you, know, it, you get the, the, the real, the, the main material comes up from elsewhere. So, um, but yeah, that'd be cool. I mean, Gilgamesh is everywhere. It's, uh, uh, it's clearly, it clearly made its way to Greece. I mean, there's no way that, that they were not, you know, that, uh, that these, that these are, that these, you know, that these early Greek poets were not familiar with the story of Gilgamesh. I, mean, I think that the evidence for it is overwhelming. Um, anybody who's read like, you know, uh, you know, Martin West's classic, you know, East Face of Helicon and, and the subsequent work like, of other scholars, uh, any actual, I should say also the work that came before that, but, but anyways, you know, I think the evidence there is, is very clear. Um, all right. And since we haven't quite hit your five minute limit here, um, Lindsay Hotel, um, mentions that I've done a lot of work on color and old Norse. Do you have any favorite color terms? Favorite story about a color name? Maybe just anything you want to say at all about color in Anatolian? What do, what do we know there? Yeah, I was just having a talk about with someone about this. We have a word that is important for uh, that. It seems to like yeah, maybe it's related to uh, words that mean uh, uh, dark or something like this. In Anatolian. So we have we have andara in Hittite, andara, mm. and it means yeah, maybe like a 
bluish color. <laughs> huh. uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's supposed to have interesting and European cognates. And for the Hittite phenologist, it's supposed to be it's super interesting because it gives you possibly the outcome of an uh, initial syllabic M. So <laughs> it would be it's the, only, it's the only example for this. So um, is it yeah, like this is really, on something? It would be mm, draw. Uh, that would be the. Uh, yes. the so is that the, the negative form. prefix? No, it's supposed to be. Uh, God, I was. I'm now only remembering the the speculative connection that my friend was. I should say speculative. The hypothesis that he was entertaining about this with some connections to, um, some other words. But it's supposed to have one, one pretty good cognate that I can't. I just can't pull it to mind right now. Yeah, yeah. I, I should know more. It's embarrassing that I don't know. Uh, I haven't thought harder about about a color. You know. Um, uh, uh, one one that's a nice color word that is much disputed in Hittite, and I've always, I mean, it's color 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 adjacent, I guess, is you're supposed to have the word for, um, uh, well, it gives you words for like uh, white in some languages, right? So you have the, um, Hittite has, Hittite has the word for cloud, alpa, oh, okay. uh, yeah. and uh, this is supposed to be Greek related to the, yeah, the Greek word for, I don't know, I think it's supposed to be the, the word for leprosy, I guess. And, and Latin uh, albus and alps. And Latin albus and, white. Yeah. And so, so if we can qualify, qualify that as a color term, um, great. Uh, for me and for most American and Europeans, this is an, a very nice example of a, a proto european A. Ah. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, you know, for those who don't believe in Indo-European A, ah, you kind of have to, I don't know, uh, bring out your whole bag of tricks to try to explain why this thing has an A ah in, in his, <laughs> what looks like an A, ah, a historical A ah at the beginning and also... Uh, a historical A uh, in, in Latin and also yeah in Greek and, and so on. Um, so so I guess maybe you know if, if that gets to be included in the color word family, we can call that we can call that my favorite. I'll include it. It's interesting. Even kind of okay. ties into the laryngeal question. It does, yeah. You, the, you, the ultra, right. So uh, yeah, under all the other alternatives, you have to figure out some way to get rid of well, under the two widely you know entertained alternatives, you have to get rid of the H2 or the H3. Uh, and then the, you know, the, the, the fourth alternative, of course, is you set up laryngeal four, the, the famous, right. uh, you know, the, the favorite of, uh, of hemp and, um, and others. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm not quite ready to go there. No, it seems like it's a high cost and, and, and very little explanatory power when it's so easy to just set up an aha. Yeah. <laughs> well, Tony, thank you so much for taking this time with us today. I know it's late over there. I know you've got many business and personal obligations. Is that a dinosaur picture on the door behind you, by the way? I think it is. This is actually my colleague's office. My office is too depressing oh. to do, to do things. It's not, it's, I shouldn't say depressing. It's, it was perfectly lively. And then my colleague who had a million books, he had like, it was a very nice looking office with a million books. And, uh, and then he got a new job and he moved. And so he took all his books with him and I don't have it, you know, I haven't been here for long enough to accumulate my own. And so now it's just like, Kind of naked and sad looking so here i am in um in my colleague's office and well I mean, uh, and she likes dinosaurs i you, guess you're, you're doing better than me because i've got like two closet doors some stuff sort of on the wall i'm getting i'm getting hard yeah. pandemic vibes from your um uh, Better. from your from your setup here i feel like you uh you know this is what we were all doing at the, at the end and then we cultivate it uh well, not me, but most people cultivated presentation spaces. Well, you know, I mostly do my presentations outside, right? True. But true, 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 so true. I never quite developed my like Zoom home office thing quite right. And there's not great light anywhere in this room except right here. So, you know, mm -hmm. I'm working on it. I'll, I'll do what I can. Well, thank you again. And uh, hope to see you again before too long. Uh, yeah. One place Let, or yeah. Let's, let's we should we should we should get together and talk about talk about other things but this was really fun thank you for having me on it's really nice to i don't know hear uh hear get great questions from people and talk to uh just 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 folks who are interested broadly in european languages i'm always happy to do that <laughs> okay. all right thank you tony uh, okay. yeah yeah thanks thank, jackson talk to you soon. thank you everyone all the best